And just a second, because it takes, uh, yeah, now it's recording. So, Alessandra, thank you very much for your uh, seminar. So, the word is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Dean. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll try to keep you, I think that my main goal here is to try to keep you awake for the next hour. So, let's see if I succeed in this test. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, uh, yes, I would like to mention as well, well, as this is a class and it's a quite long class, so if you if you have any question, if you like to say anything, so please interrupt me at any time, okay? Um, and I'm going to ask Danielle as well, if I forget to stop to do a break, so please remind me because, you know, sometimes we start to talk and get too excited and, and forget uh, to, to stop a little bit and it's important. Okay. okay, no problem. Okay, thank you, Daniel. All right, so uh, at this point, you know, of the, the, the course, I guess you are already uh, quite familiar with these images, right? So that's the, the closed loop reservoir uh, development and management uh, methodology that Professor Dennis proposed. And I think you are very familiar with that. I guess you are familiar right, with that. Uh, and I'm using this image just to, to, to start the conversation to point where we are in this workflow, right? So, well, just a, a quick recap uh, for those who don't really remember, but uh, the green part uh, concerns the past, right? Uh, sorry, the green part concerns the, the models generation and, and construction. So the right part, the, the red part is the, the models calibration, so the data simulation. The blue part concerns the future, where we take decisions, uh, long-term decisions. And then the black part is related to short-term uh, production optimization, right? So when we talk about 4D seismic data, uh, actually uh, not only 4D, but 3D seismic data as well. So this is where we integrate things. Uh, let me put the pointer here. Okay, yeah, so where I, I add these stars, it's where we use, uh, where we integrate the seismic data into this process, right? So for the 3D seismic data, usually uh, we, we use this information in steps one and two. So this is very important to, to define the, the structure of the, of the reservoir model and like faults, the, the boundaries and so on. And also in step four, the scenarios generation. So uh, the size, the three D seismic data can be a, a, a good guide to to populate the grids uh, to generate process, for instance. Uh, the four D seismic data, which is actually the main topic of this class, uh, is usually is used here in step five. So that's the data, as Professor Dan has already uh, said, is a data that we use in, in the data simulation procedures, right? So together with well data to calibrate the models, we also use the 4D seismic data. So this will be um, the most common approach. But indeed, the 4D size can also be used here, in the green parts to, to improve the geological models. Uh, and actually, this is a more, uh, you take, it's more challenging to do, but it's, it's a best practice. I also added a star here. So this is like, a, well, this is not the, the best thing to do, but sometimes we don't have time to do all of the other steps, you know, in, if you think in, in, the, in the real world where we need to take decisions uh, very quickly. So sometimes people do not have time to do a proper calibration of the models and they might use the 4D seismic data to guide some uh, uh, decisions, like uh, if they need to, to drill uh, an infill well and then the, the data arrive very, um, in a moment that, that they don't have too much time to calibrate the model and so on, they might just use these images to guide uh, this type of decision, okay? Uh, so being said that, so this was just an introduction to locate the, the talk. And here I have an outline of the, the class. So I split in two parts. So in the first part, I, I talk a little bit about uh, 3D seismic data. Uh, well. Uh, it's a bit strange to do online class because we are not. I'm not looking at views, but uh, anyway, uh, I think most of you are, are engineers. Uh, that's usually what happens in this course. So, so that's why I have this part where I'm going to explain a little bit what what is the seismic data, and, and uh, it's a kind of general view of 3D seismic data because it helps 
help us to understand uh, the second part we, where I'm going to explain about for the seismic data. So what is it and why is important and how we do it, how we use it in data simulation and I'll, I'll finish with some, uh, some examples. So the first part, so what, what is seismic, right? So that's the very beginning of the things. Uh, so the seismic data is, of course, as I think you, you've heard about it, so it's an image of the subsurface. So, but it's, it's, it's funny to hear that uh, it looks like um, sometimes I'm talking between friends uh, that are not from this area and they, they look at seismic as a, something very strange that we don't really know what we're seeing. So uh, like a mystic sign or something like this. So I'm trying to, to explain a little bit more how this, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, to explain how these signs are, are created at, with this class, okay? So if you have a rock, let's say, for instance, a rock like this, so the size of the image is, is something like that, you know, so what we see in the image, uh, so these things, the signals, we call it the, the reflections, right? And these are signals of the interface. So every time you have different formations, so different uh, types of rocks, then we are going to see this type of signals, which is a, it's an interface between two different uh, rocks, okay? And by different, it can be different in, in, in a very general sense. So different uh, uh, lithology or different, uh, the same rock with different fluid contents and so on. So, but what is that? So this is another image. So that's a, a real seismic data. And this is a, actually a, a pretty good uh, size image where we can see a lot of, uh, a lot of, of horizons. Uh, I don't, for, for the, I don't know if we have some geologists in the, in the, in the the group but uh we can see some faults here and so on so so this is a very nice picture uh, that we have we, we have this type of picture after processing all the data and so on but what's behind this scene right so this image you're, you're looking at this moment are the seismic trace so it's exactly the same thing right so this image this one and this one is exactly the same thing it's just a matrix and and the difference between these two images these two slides is how i'm plotting this matrix okay so this is a more beautiful way of seeing things where the geologists will be could be easily more easily could more easily see the the all these structures and here is more like uh showing the signals how it is how it is it is behind it so so this the image that i show i'm just showing it just to, to say that the, the size image it's a set of traces okay um so i'm going to try to explain how how this thing how these traces are, are built right so we start uh talking about the seismic survey okay so the seismic service is a size seismic survey uh is uh well is the most widely used geophysical method in, the, in our industry okay is one of the most important there are another there are other geophysical methods but the size is, is the most used and well they can be carried on on land or on the sea of course depends if you're on shore or shore but the, in the procedure is the same for both so we generate uh elastic waves okay through an artificial source which can be if you are on shore for instance it can be a dynamite or a truck that we call vibrosize you know just to generate this wave field in the earth um, and then, uh, and then this wave field is captured by some receptors. I'm going to show you a picture in the next slide. So if you are onshore, you have dynamite. Uh, if you are offshore, we have an air gun. So an air gun, it's a gun that generates a bubble uh, of air uh, in the ocean. And this, this is an elastic wave field. And this wave field is going to propagate through the, the water layer and is going to penetrate the, the ground and it's going to be reflected uh, to the surface, okay? And then we have these guys here, so the geophones for the, for the onshore situation and hydrophones for, for offshore, that are the receivers that are going to capture the signals. So that's the, the, the schematic uh, uh, image of how things happen, right? So we have here, uh, so this is an air gun, and then it's generate this uh, uh, last wave field. So the wave is, is propagating through the sea, and then uh, we have it reached the seabed, 
And every time, and then it penetrates into the ground, right? So every time uh, the, the wave reaches, uh, finds actually a, a different uh, rock, as we show in this, this picture, so uh, the, the wave is reflected back to the surface. So you see, all the time it finds different from uh, different formations or rock with different fluid contents. It's being reflected, and then you have the receivers here. In this case, the hydrophones, and they are uh, they are just waiting these waves to to arrive uh, back to them. Okay. So the onshore is the same situation. The only, of course, we don't have a boat, uh, <laughs> for very clear reasons. Uh, but then we have a source here that. Uh, in the past, uh, they use dynamite, but now I think it's more common to use the truck. But the physics, the problem is the same. You know, the wave, the, the wave field is generate, is generated, and then the wave is propagating through the earth and is reflected back uh, through the through the so that the receivers can capture it. Okay, so this is well, this an image is more like a curiosity. Uh, so this is a actual uh, a picture. So that's a boat that is pulling all the 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 streamers here, so we, we call it streamers, those cables that are, are that those cables that have the receivers, right? And typically they are three to eight kilometers long, so eight kilometers long. So this is a very big uh, uh, operation, you know, the size of service can be a really, really big operation. Uh, sometimes these streamers can reach up to 12 kilometers long. So so this is, is really a lot. Uh, I always use this as a reference for those who are are familiar with this so this is one of our most famous beach in brazil so uh this beach copacabana beach has four kilometers uh in extension and so these cables they are uh sometimes more than the double of the the extension of the copacabana beach so just the size of the cable right so this is really big uh, okay, so coming back to the size of traces. So how how uh, being said how the the acquisition works. Uh, now I'm going to to explain you how the size of trace uh, how it's it's built. How what this means, right? So in this uh, uh, draw here, okay, again we have this again, and then I have the receivers here. So if you look at just the one of the receivers, so the first one, the very first one. So as I said, the wave field travel through the through the to the water layer here, and then goes into the ground, right? So this receiver is is there, stopped there, just waiting for this wave field, right? So when this wave field uh, reaches the receiver, so the first one is going to be this one, the one that was reflected here in the first interface, which is the seabed, right? Uh, the receiver is going to record the time the signals happen. So the time, so let's say the, the gun is shot, you have a shot. Then after I don't know one one second, uh, this wave field uh, arrives in the receptor. So the receptor is going to register this time, one second, and the intensity, the strength of the of this wave field. So the, the strength of the wave field is the, the amplitude of the signal, right? So then um, it registers this signal and it waits till something else happen. And this something else here is the second wave that it's arriving a little bit. Um, later later on after i don't know 30 milliseconds or something like this depends on the case on the rocks and so on so that's how the the, the seismic trace is built right so this that's how it happens for the first receivers then the same the same physics is going to happen for the second receivers and then the third and so on uh so one thing to note is that, uh, of course, for the the, for the second receiver, uh, the the path the wave is, is is traveling is bigger. Of course, the distance here is bigger, so this path is bigger than this one. And as the velocity is the same, right? So that's the, the velocity of the, of the the wave propagation is the same. That's the the ocean. Uh, it takes a little bit longer. You see, so yeah, so so the time is increasing. Uh, from top to, to base of this of this uh, the y-axis so it takes a little bit longer for this sign to 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 reach uh the second receiver so that's why it's a little bit uh down there and then for the same reason the third receiver also registered this a little bit uh after uh, in time i have to say sorry we have some special uh, uh participation here so that's my daughter but so if, if 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 she speaks louder than me, please tell me, and then I can go back and, and explain better, right? 
Uh, okay, so in the end, uh, so that's the type of signal uh, that we uh, that we have after no, like this is a very raw data, the data we have after acquiring so raw and, and old data. This is a, this is just an example. So we are not seeing any geological features, anything at this moment, because this that's the raw data. The data needs to be processed. Okay. So uh, if we think in, in, in modeling a, a seismic trace, uh, what we would expect, right? So if you assume the Earth is this layered uh, cake, uh, follows this uh, layer cake model, you know, where we have very well-behaved layers and they're uh, parallel to each other, so on. So that would be the ideal uh, seismogram we would have. That's what uh, the geophysicists or the interpreters, uh, the geologists, they would love to have. Which means, so every time we have a different layers, we are going to have this spike that are going to point to us where we have these different layers. And the, strength, the, the size of the spike would uh, indicate uh, the difference between the two rocks. If the two rocks are very different, then we have a, a higher, uh, yeah. a bigger spike here. And if the two rocks, if two rocks are, are, are more similar to each other, then a smaller spike and so on. So this will be the ideal world, uh, but life is, is not simple as that. Uh, so this is very idea and never happens uh, because of the nature. So uh, basically, uh, if, you, if, if you remember from some uh, theoretical background from processing size uh, signals and so on, so this will be a time representation of an infinite frequency spectrum. So it means I have a frequency spectrum with, with infinite bandwidth. So this is impossible to have in nature uh, for our case for two reasons. So the first reason is that the source is limited. So we cannot generate a source that is this spike. You know, uh, the, the source itself has a limited frequency spectrum. And the second one is that the Earth acts like a, as a filter. So uh, uh, as long as the wave field is propagating to the Earth, the Earth is filtering the frequency, especially the high frequencies filtered. So it's really impossible to have this infinite frequency spectrum. So that's is the that's how a real seismogram looks like. So it has some issues, you know, some noise and also some difference between different formations and so on. But that's that's our life. So uh, if we think uh, in, in a model, you know, uh, how we can use, uh, how we could define a seismic trace and use a mathematical equation. So we use this equation down here. So this is uh, uh, actually, it's a, it's a simple equation. Uh, it's a convolution model as we call it, right? Um, so uh, let's assume here we have, uh, it is a, like a log data, right? So uh, each box here is a different rock with just different texture, different mythology, so different rocks, different formations. So for these rocks, we have different, um, uh, if, we, if we run a well logging, uh, we have different properties, right? So this is one of the properties that we can, uh, that we can uh, measure from the rocks, so which you call impedance, right? So that's, uh, it's, it's measured by the density log uh, times the, the density, the sonic log, which, which measures the velocity of propagation. Okay, so the impedance here is showing that, okay, I have different values, you see, so for impedance, each rock has a different value. Sometimes we have rocks with different, uh, of different, with different features, but they have the same impedance of value, so this is common. And, and so on till forth. So uh, yeah, another thing is that, uh, well, okay, we well, have an impedance value for this rock, and then that one in blue uh, has a, a value that is a bit, a little bit smaller. Then this one, the impedance is higher, it's a bit, bit higher again, and then this is the smallest and so on. So that's the nature, that's how the rocks behave, you know, so different formations and different properties. So there is a, uh, we call uh, a reflectivity, which means uh, that kind of ideal seismogram I was mentioning uh, before. So that's a, 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 this is just saying it's a ratio between the, the, the variations of this impedance. So if I go from this value to this value, so it's decreasing, so that's a negative uh, reflectivity. So it's a ratio of these of this things, right? So here is positive because it's, go, it's going from a, a smaller value to a higher value and so on. So the seismic trace, mathematically, it's a 
convolution, so that's the convolution of this reflectivity and a wavelet that it's a, which is a, it's just a, a, a sign here, like a cosine or a sine, you know, it's a, it's a, a modeling of, of, a, of a signal. So if we have, uh, let's assume that here on the right, uh, uh, I'm assuming a, a very, uh, a more simplified uh, example. So if I have just these two uh, rocks, so just this one and this one down here, this will be how this seismic trace would look like, right? So it's a negative peak and then it's located in the interface between these two rocks. So the second trace means the same thing. So if I just have these two rocks, it will be a positive peak and then at the interface of the rocks. And the same thing for all the others, right? So note that this one is very, there is a very big negative peak because uh, the impedance change from this one to that one is, is very big, right? So this will be how the size, the, the signals would be uh, if we have, if we're, if we're assuming that we have uh, like uh, independent uh, trade independent signals for each of these pairs of, of formations but in reality this will be the final uh the final seismic trace right so one thing that i would like to mention is that well the size the, the actual seismic trace which is a kind of uh, it's a composition of all of these and this is just a modeling uh, exercise right so that's the final seismic trace that we would have in a size in an actual seismic acquisition so it suffers from inter interference. So if we have layers very close together or very thin layers, the signals, they are going to interfere. So this will be a problem that we call, uh, that is related to the resolution of the data, okay? Um, all right, so that's how uh, we model the seismic trace then. So this seismic signal, which is the signal that we acquire, it's this function, the reflectivity function, convolved with a wavelet plus a noise, right? Uh, okay, so uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the size waves. Uh, uh, so if you have a seismic source, source anywhere on Earth, it generates four types of seismic wave. So we have the compressional uh, wave, the shear wave, the railing, and the log wave. So these waves, they, they uh, travel through the Earth in different ways, right? So for the, the, the oil exploration, I mean, the oil industry in general, these two waves are the most important. The other two, they are more, um, they are more close to the surface, so it's not very important for, for our purpose here. So what I'd like to highlight here is these two. So the first one is the P wave, as we call, and then the S wave. So P wave, that's what we call a, a compressional wave, and the shear wave. So the P wave is shaking uh, the, the ground particles in the same direction of the, the wave propagation, right? So it's like this. And the shear wave is shaking. So the particle motion is uh, on the perpendicular direction of the direction of wave propagation. So just different ways of, of, of traveling through, uh, of, of actually shaking the, the, so the earth uh, particles, okay? Um, right, so when we have uh, uh, an incident wave, so if we assume we have medium one and two, so medium one and medium two are, are two rocks, right? So assume that on the top, this part here is medium one, so it's a, it's a rock with some features, and then medium two is another rock with different features, right? So if we have a wave that is traveling through this medium, this could be the seabed, for instance, right? Or any, so this could be the top of the reservoir where I'll have uh, different rocks uh, uh, between the reservoir and the overburden. So if you have a wave that is uh, incident here, an incident wave, uh, this wave is, is, reflect, is reflected up to the surface so that we can re uh, the receivers can capture it and also is refracted. So part of the energy here, uh, we, we kind of lose it because it's refracted through the earth, right? And the one that is re reflects uh, our, our record, right? So if you have a P wave incident, we have this wave is split into S wave and P wave. And the reflection coefficients, uh, that reflectivity, sorry, I was showing here in this equation is in this case, uh, 
what we call a uh, normal incidence, you know, it's assuming that we don't have this angle, just for simplification purpose here, this equation is very simple. So I, t I told you before that it was a ratio between impedance, and that's exactly what I'm grading. So that's the difference between the impedance of medium two and one, the difference, uh, again, uh, divided by the sum, the sum of them. Right, so this is a very uh, simple equation, and we use it a lot. Uh, you, you're going to understand why I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the things because uh, when I'm show, I'm going to show the pictures and, and how we use the, the seismic data. Then I think things are start to be more connected, right? So for this, for for now, we just I just would like to highlight that this uh, the reflection, uh, the, the reflection that we are. Uh, the seismic signals, uh, they carry this information about the impedance of the rocks, so which is related to the density of the rocks and the velocity, so the, the velocity of sound, I mean, the velocity of propagation of the waves. Oops, sorry, there is a slide in Portuguese here. Uh, I can translate later. So this is, uh, I'm talking about size resolution, right? So uh, so the size, uh, the size resolution, um, is uh, the capacity of the seismic signals to uh, to see two events that are very close together, okay? So uh, there is a rule of thumb here, which is this calculation that says, okay, uh, so lambda is the wavelength of the, the dominant wavelength, right? Uh, so it's the same as uh, velocity divided by frequency. So this uh, small rule here says that, if you have a, a formation that it is smaller than this uh, lambda over four, then we cannot differentiate between the two events, like the top and the base of this formation. So if this value is bigger than this lambda over four, then it's, it is possible. That's exactly what I'm showing here, right? So let's assume that we have this formation here. So that this is a very thin bed. Right, so this is the the thickness in this this uh, synthetical exercise. Uh, the the thickness here is lambda over sixteen, so it's smaller than that row that I just told you, right? So what happens? So let's assume that's my reservoir. So this is the top of the reservoir, and that's the base of the reservoir. So if we could look at it, uh, if if it was possible to have the this the signal of the top and of the base, that's how it it would look like. But we know that in the end, the, these things, they come together. So they will look like this. So this is the type of seismic signals that we are going to have for this case. I mean, it's we, we don't see, we don't have a sign like a peak or a trough for the base, or, uh, the top and the base of the reservoir. So as long as we increase this, the thickness of this, the bad thickness here, of this reservoir in my example, uh, then uh, things start to get a little better. When we, we we reach this value lambda over four, note that the seismic signal here. So we have uh, so the thickness here is is bigger, right, compared to these ones. It's a little bit bigger. So now we start to see two things here. So for an interpreter that's going to see these seismic signals, it start uh, the, the life starts to be a little bit uh, easier, let's say, because you, you we can we can identify the top and the base, right? So if you have say for instance this uh, then life is much is much easier because now I have a peak here that it's showing me that that's the top of the reservoir. And then I have another peak here that is showing that the base of this thick, uh, more or thicker uh, reservoir. Okay, so uh, every time we have uh, formations that we know they are not, they are thin, so we need to be careful about seismic resolution. And, uh, and sometimes this is very challenging, you know, because uh, the reservoir might be thin like this, and then we have a, a simulation model. Uh, to fill up this with some properties, but then we reach this uh, limit of size resolution, and then sometimes the size can cannot do so much, you know, because of this limitation. Okay, so uh, this is a, a quite nice picture. I think that it gives us uh, give us uh, an idea of of these things related to resolution, you know. So. 
we have a, a lot of things going on here in terms of uh, geology, but then the, the seismic trace is like this, poof. It's, a, it's a, like a big, uh, a really big uh, average of the, the whole thing, you know? And well, and that's, that's how it is. Okay, so here I, I, I brought some examples, some values. So I told you that uh, this lambda was uh, the velocity split by frequency. So the velocity uh, of, of the wave propagation, so that's the P velocity, uh, it changes according to the rock. So each rock has a different velocity, right? Depends on the, the structure of the rocks, the fluid content, and so on. So and the frequency also uh, depends uh, depends uh, on the, the on the type of acquisition you have the, the frequency and also depends a bit on, on the type of, of, of rock. So if we do some quick calculations here, uh, this this rule of thumb that I mentioned the lambda over four uh, will have some value. So let's assume a situation where we have a size velocity around three thousand, which is is quite okay for, for for our problems the problems that we deal with and an average frequency uh, of 40 hertz so it gives me gives me a resolution of 18 meters so that's more or less uh, uh the type the, the number that we work between 15 uh, to 20 meters uh so it depends a lot on the size acquisition actually so just for you to have in mind that this is the 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 type of vertical resolution uh, we are going to have in, in the real world, okay? So if, uh, so layer, so uh, thick, uh, uh, sorry, so formations with, uh, um, that are very thin, that has, for instance, five meters of thickness, uh, this type of layers will be, uh, you know, we, we will, won't be able to detect them. Uh, okay, so this is uh, the Unicin One data. I, I know, I know. I think I, everyone, I guess, is using Unicin data it's just for you to see something more familiar. So this is uh, the reference model, the very uh, thin model. It's a uh, it's high resolution, so the the layers here are very thin. Uh, and then we here internally in the group we generate uh, a synthetic seismic data for this case for this uh, benchmark, right? So this will be the ideal size of impedance. So that's the P impedance, right? So this is how the P impedance in a perfect data would like, right? So we see uh, very thin uh, layers, we can identify the difference and so on. And then after we do the size modeling, uh, that's how uh, the P impedance, the same P impedance would look like, you see? So of course we lose a lot of details here. So we, we cannot see it. But of course, the data is still uh, is still very useful because the trends, the general trends, are kept, so we can identify high and low impedance regions and, and so on. And uh, just to, to remember that the impedance uh, it's a property that is very close related to to porosity. So, so in a real world, I would say uh, we would acquire this type of information for to generate a, a reservoir model for instance so this could be used to guide the procedure so i can input this data inside the procedure and say okay i know that this is a low uh low porous sorry low impedance means a uh, high porous so this is a high porous zone this is a, a low porous zone and so on okay so now uh, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll talk about 3D seismic data. Um, so this is a, a very concise work in sequence just for you to have an idea how things uh, work in, in the real world. So we have the seismic acquisition, which the, the acquisition uh, is a very uh, big stuff uh, uh, to, to be done, right? So it can, take, uh, it can take up to one year or more or less. Well, depends a little bit, of course, of this, the, the area that is going to be uh, uh, acquired, right? But it's a, it's something uh, that takes uh, quite a lot of time. Then we have the processing. So this is just a, an example, just a, a, well, just a picture to illustrate that. So it's another. Pro so we need to take all of this data. So we need to remove the noise. We need to do to apply uh, some mathematical uh, 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 procedures to so that we can. Uh, convert, let's say, or build uh, uh, an actual uh, image of the surface, right? 
So the processing is also something that takes a lot of time, of course, depends on the size of the survey. Uh, but it's also a, a, a thing that can take up to years or more. Okay. Uh, well, this is an example with our horrible data. So this data, I took, I picked it from the internet. So uh, <laughs> uh, this is very bad data. I mean, uh, it's very noisy, but this is just an example where we have the raw data here on the right side and then after uh, the noise procedure. So just a simple example. Then we have, uh, after we process the data, we have the interpretation. So this is a, an image that I'll speak from the internet. Uh, and to, to talk about uh, interpretation. So this is uh, actually is not a very good size. So this is a no, it's an old size. Nowadays we have a much better quality of images, like the ones I showed in the very beginning of the of this uh, class. But this is just a, a, a curiosity that I, I like to bring in the class, right? So imagine that you are a, a interpreter, uh, you, which is usually a geologist, right? So imagine that you need to interpret this data. So what would you pick, right? So some people tells me that they can see anything here. It's just, uh, uh, it's pure noise. So, uh, which I kind of agree because the data is really bad. But someone has done it. So you see, so there are some uh, important horizons that, that uh, this interpret uh, has uh, picked here. And now some structure. So here some faults and so on. Okay, so that's the interpretation with a very uh, bad date, right? Um, okay, so then uh, the next step will be um, the reservoir studies. So that's where we start to link again with the, the, the main topic of this class, right? The link with the reservoir model. So after uh, we, we have done all the interpretation of the seismic data, it's possible to define First of all, of course, we in a, when you think in an exploration scenario, you find the reservoir, right? But now at this moment, you have already found it, so you you have already reservoir, you know it's there, and then it's you, it's, uh, it's going to start producing, so it's it is already producing. So uh, with this this interpretation, you, we can build the reservoir model, so it can define the limits like top, bottom, and the sides, the, the boundaries. Uh, also, uh, you can identify the presence of faults, uh, but of course, the faults can be seen on the seismic data, depends on the resolution. If it's a big event, uh, then we can see it, but if there, if it's a small fault or smaller things, then usually we, we, we cannot see it. But anyway, all of this is used to build the structure of the reservoir model, right? Uh, and then after you will be we build this structure, uh, these uh, models. It's uh, I guess uh, well, Manuel probably he, he explained it much better by the way uh, about this. But after we have this structure, then this model is populated. Uh, the grid cells are populated with uh, the rock properties, right? So then we use the well profiles and also uh, the 3D seismic data to generate the model. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I have to mention uh, uh, one of the procedures that it's very common uh, in, in reservoir studies uh, that is usually uh, performed, which is performed actually by geophysicists, which it, we call size conversion. So I'm back again with, with that picture that I showed in the very beginning. So, okay, so remember that we have this equation. So the size is the, that's the reflect, this um, reflectivity, which is this very simple equation convolve it with a wavelet to give this shape of sine, right? Plus noise. So what happened is, uh, so that's a, an, an image uh, of a seismic date. So this is actually from only seeing one. So in the real world, that's the image we would uh, receive, right? So after acquiring and processing the data, that's uh, how it arrives in the, the reservoir for the reservoir studies. So uh, usually, uh, so these, as I said in the beginning, so this is this the seismic signals. Uh, it's a, uh, a uh, well, I forgot the name. So it's a um, it's a, the reflectivity is is an interface interface. That's the word. It's an interface property, right? So it shows it shows us where we have different rocks. So I have this strong signal to point that I have two rocks with different, very different uh, um, properties, right? So it's an interface property, 
But the interface property is not very useful for reservoir studs. We don't really want to know uh, how different one rock is, the, uh, is from the other, right? What we want to know are the actual properties of the rocks. I want to know if this rock is, has a higher porosity or a low porosity. I don't, I don't really care if I have a higher porosity over a, a low porosity rock, rock, for instance. So then we need to convert those signals that are related to the interface between the rocks to uh, to the actual rock properties. So this uh, that's what we call uh, seismic data. So the input data is the, the signals, the trace, and then we run an inversion procedure. It's a mathematical it's inversion. And then we estimate the actual rock properties. So here we estimate, so we use this guy to estimate these guys here. So the P impedance or the density of the rocks or the velocity of the rocks. So I'm moving from the world of signals, seismic signals and so on, to the world of rock properties. So this is a very important procedure. So because this type of data, the results of the inversion, that's what we use for reservoir mainly. Um, okay, so that these are here I brought some examples. So this is Unisim 1 again. So this will be the observer data for Unisim 1, for instance, the observer 3D seismic data. And this is the inverted 3D seismic data. As I mentioned in one of these previous slides, uh, I can map here, I can see uh, the trends, like low and high impedance trends, and I can use it to populate the grid, to guide the population of the grid in terms of porosity. Uh, and then on the right side is the same, So, but this is the real data, okay? So that's the seismic data, how it comes, and then this is the seismic data after inversion. So I'm coming from an interface word to uh, a rock properties word. We are assessing the rock properties. Of course, with all the problems that we have, you know, which is we have noise that interferes on the results on the quality of this inversion. We have the things related to the resolution that I already mentioned. But well, uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a very important date. Okay. Um, all right. So um, as I said, uh, well. Uh, we can use these properties uh, to estimate process actually. So uh, there are different ways of using this data here, the impedance data in the geological modeling. You can just use it as a background property to model the grid, like just saying Petrel can do it. So you just say, okay, use, use these uh, properties as a guide, you know? So you can you, you can put high porosity and low porosity following these, these, uh, these properties. But also, you can do something a little bit more sophisticated in terms of seismic data. Uh, you can actually estimate porosity, that's what we're showing here. So you can estimate the actual porosity from the seismic data. So from these inversions, so these inversion results, you apply, a, uh, uh, in this case, it's a petrophysical inversion. This is from CGG, it's a, this inversion is, is, is their uh, property. Uh, but then you can estimate the porosity actually so this they're doing uh, of course they are selling the product so we need to be careful with that but uh, it's an example to show that okay this will be this is the porosity model uh, for uh, its initial reservoir model so this is a very smooth um, because this is a single model right so uh, assume that you just have a single model so this is like an average porosity um, that someone could use and this is how the porosity would look like if you estimate it from size so this is just a, a possibility that I'm, I'm bringing here uh, but this type of very smooth model uh, that's something that we 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 do not really use it anymore to be honest uh, especially in unisim because we we don't use a single model we use several possibilities Another thing that we can use the 3D seismic data is to estimate the lithology and fluid content. So, for instance, in this image here, uh, it's also from CGG. So, it's also they're also again selling their product. So, we need to be careful. But this is an actual. Uh, it's a real image, as far as I'm concerned. And then we can see here is the probability, the hydrocarbon sand probability. So, the black stuff means uh, hydrocarbon. So, we can see. Uh, delineate where the oil is okay with this seismic data of course this is a very uh, this is a much more advanced procedure this is not usually uh, applied for all the fields and so on and it depends a lot on the quality of, of the data and the complexity of the the reservoir and so on okay mm -hmm. so 
now uh, I'm going to start uh, with uh, for this seismic data. So uh, you are very quiet. I know that you are quiet people, but you have any comments on the 3D seismic data? Did it make any sense or is it okay? You are totally lost or everyone's sleeping already? Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. I'm going to, to continue here then with the, the 4D uh, seismic data. I think I'm going too fast, uh, but anyway, let's go. Okay, so I talk about 3D seismic data, and now we have a fourth dimension, right? So the 4D seismic data. So what is this fourth dimension? Uh, I, I bring these uh, these uh, these pictures, uh, which I think it's 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 quite interesting. It's actually a very beautiful work. Uh, this is a uh, there's a photographer which calls Nicholas Nixon, and he took, he took pictures from these four uh, sisters uh, during 40 years. So every year they, he was uh, taking these pictures. And then there is a very beautiful work uh, that he, he made, uh, and then discussing well things that change between time, how how they they change. Uh, uh, how each one change a long time so so uh, the idea here of for this seismic data is exactly the same so but we are going to to have images of the the reservoir of course not people but the oil uh, reservoir right but then we are going to see how the reservoir is uh, is uh, evolving with time okay all right so that's the idea then so we have uh, an initial seismic survey which we call baseline and time at time zero this can be for instance the exploration seismic before uh before the the field uh, starts to produce or it can be a more dedicated uh, uh dedicated to 4d to its uh, seismic service it can be before production and after production depends a lot on each case but anyway you have a, a 3d size requisition here and then uh the reservoir starts producing or is already producing and along as as long as the production happens um we start we acquire more and more uh size volumes okay so we call it monitor service so we have in this uh, illustrative example i'm showing here four monitor service so uh, as I'm, I'm saying here, ideally the baseline survey uh, it should it will be a pre-production survey. Okay, so why why is that? Because it will be very nice to see how is the reservoir before anything happens, before we before you know doing why the reservoir is it is it is in equilibrium, you know. So how how the reservoir was before anything before any well. Uh, because then, when we acquire a new one, a new size monitor, we could we could clearly see what changed. You know, we see how the reservoir was and now how it is. But sometimes it, it, we don't have the situation. Usually we don't, we do not, because uh, the baseline, the, the the exploration size, for instance, before you drill any well, uh, they are usually uh, very uh, not very, but they are they have low quality, low quality for for these studies, you know, so sometimes they, they cannot be uh, used. So, so it's common that the baseline survey, the first one that we use for, for these seismic studies, uh, happens before, after, sorry, after the production has already started. But anyway, still though, we can get very useful information from that. Uh, some frequent questions, how many monitors? And what's the frequency of the monitors? So how, how do things happen? So there are several possibilities and depends on each case. So depends, of course, on, on the importance of the fields, uh, because, uh, of course, you need to invest some money on this type of things. And uh, and then the amount of, of, of money you, you're going to invest depends on, on, on how, how profitable is the field, right? And also the frequency of acquisition depends, of course, on the investments, but also depends on some previous studies that uh, I'm going to talk a little bit later with more details, but some previous studies that we do to see uh, if we are going to have any signals, right? When we are going to have 4D signals. 
so uh, for instance, uh, if if we if you go back to that example of, of the of the girls, the, the women that are the, that were uh, photographed, um, depends if, if we okay, he took the pictures every every year, right? But let's say if I'm going to take the picture uh, every month, probably uh, I'm not going to see if I compare two uh, consecutive months, probably I'm not going to see too much change, right? I need to wait some time so that I can see the change. So it's the same for the reservoir. If I take a size server today and another one in one month, for instance, uh, usually we cannot see it. So, but sometimes they do it in a very short period of time. It depends a lot on the, the production strategy that is being applied to the field. You know, if you are, if it's a very dy dynamic field, then uh, then you have uh, uh, more possibilities to see the size machine. Uh, okay, so the fourth dimension is time, right? So as I said, so is the time, how the time is, is going. Uh, but just this is just a quick remind that uh, if you remember in the very beginning of the class, I mentioned that the, the receivers uh, is registering the time of the arrivals of the wave. That's how we build the seismic trace, right? So this vertical axis of seismic data, so we, when you think in a 3D volume, so we have x, y, right, so which is the spatial coordinates, and the third uh, coordination, which is in the depth coordination, is in time, actually, so because it's the time of the arrival of the waves, right, it's a bit weird, so this is nothing that as we would like to be, but anyway, this is just remember that this time is not this time, okay, so the, for the size, the repetition of the 3D size reserve along field production, and also the 4D seismic data is also called uh, time-lapse size, so it's the same thing. 4D size or time lapse size. Okay, so and why 4D size work? So what, what's happening, right? Sorry, hello. Yes. Um, good morning. Sorry to interrupt the class. Yes. I'm, no, I'm thank you very much for interrupting because I feel that I'm talking alone here. <laughs> um, so it's about the um, seismic resolution you talked about. Yes. Um, it's been a very serious problem um, resolving seismic resolution. But I wanted to ask if you have any opinions on um, how we can pick up um, tiny structures or reservoirs on seismic, even with um, low resolution. Yeah, well, this is a hard question. <laughs> uh, one thing uh, okay, I could have mentioned here, if I go back to some slides, yeah. So, this is actually a, a, an example of something like this. So we have the, so that's the, the size data, right? So the amplitude, the signals, and this is after inversion. So one of the, the things that I would, uh, I would give you as an answer is uh, looking at size conversions, because this procedure, as we also use well log data that is very high, uh, that has a very high resolution, we know it in that, right? Uh, so it helps the, the the inversion, right? So the inversion procedure sometimes increases the, the vertical resolution. So here, for instance, uh, you see this is a this is a yellow horizon here. So sorry, it's in Portuguese uh, this reference, but there is a yellow horizon here. Okay, let's start for this one. So this pink horizon, it was picked by a, a, an interpreter. Then you have this yellow here. So then the interpreter was picking, and then sometimes. You see, the signal, it starts to vanish, so it's very difficult. And then after running the inversion, you see here the yellow. So now uh, you, we see the rock structure, so you can easily find uh, the, easily uh, pick the horizon in a more safe, in a more safe way, I would say. So this will be something to try. You know, a size conversion, it might enhance the vertical resolution of the signal. So. Uh, there are also some uh, specific procedures. So this is a, like a, 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 a traditional uh, inversion, I would say. But there are also some more sophisticated size inversion procedures. Some of them is called uh, stochastic or geostatistical inversion. And these procedures, they are more, well, they are more expensive to run, but they also have this potential of increasing the vertical resolution. So this will be a, a something to, to try, okay? Another thing is that uh, this is actually happening in one of our projects in Unicin. 
so I'm talking here about 3D seismic data, right? But then uh, the 4D seismic data sometimes uh, it brings us some bring us some surprise, and uh, sometimes we we start to see some geological features that are very uh, they are um, below the the size resolution with 4D seismic data. Uh, because of the way the, the signals are, well, I'm going to explain a little bit more, but, but this, this can happen. So for the seismic data, also it's a tool to, to identify uh, thin uh, geological features. Uh, you know, I, I have, I'm sorry, I don't have in this presentation, but if you're curious, I can, we can, I can share with you some, something after. Uh, but this is one of the things that we saw for a real, a real field, a real data that we have in a project uh, that we have in UNICEF. Okay, so I don't know if I answer your question. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, a quick one. Um, this um, inversion, this seismic inversion here on this slide, um, was this done with petrol or is there a different software you used to generate it? Okay, uh, so this, sorry, I have to say this one, I'm sorry, I don't know which software they use because this is from this, uh, this is another Brazilian university and it's a master thesis, so I don't remember, but I think here they use a... Uh, Ah, what's the name? Um, mm, oh, I forgot the name of the software. Well, it comes later. But and but uh, uh, so this one is we did uh, with the synthetic data. We see uh, here we use uh, the software from CGG, uh, which is called Hanson Russell. And this one is another software from from the the same company, CGG, but JSON. Sorry, JSON. That's the name. They probably use JSON here, and this, and here we use Hampson Russell. But Petrel has uh, uh, some very interesting tools as well for 3D size conversion, and 4D as well. But 3D is more. We we had a, a very good surprise in the same project I mentioned about 4D size data. Uh, we we have this set of uh, well, it's a Brazilian field, right? So it's a real uh, data that we receive it, and uh, we run some size conversion with Petrel. And we have quite good insights on, on that. You know. There is an inversion, they call it uh, genetic inversion, which is pretty much easy to, to run. Uh, you don't need to, well, you need to know the basics, but uh, it's not very, because running size conversion sometimes is tricky. You, know. you need to prepare the data, you need to tie the well logs with the size of data, and so on. But this inversion called genetic inversion inside Petrel, it's more, it's something more, uh, more easy to run, and we have very nice results uh, for, for the the field case we have in the group. So I think that's something also interesting to have a look. Thank you very much. Okay, no problem. And thank you for letting me know that there is at least one that is not sleeping. <laughs> All right. So, okay, I'm going back here for the for new work. So, why for this size it works? What's behind the scenes, right? So, as I, I said, since the beginning of the class, the seismic signal it's sensitive to variations, right? Every time, as you know, I'm repeating it a lot of times, but the the, the signals, the seismic signals, indicate where we have different rocks, right? So every time we have different formations, then we are going to have the signals, right? So the seismic signals is sensitive to the variations of lithology, fluid, pressure. So if you have anything different in the rocks, the seismic signals will capture it. So when we have two or more seismic surveys, which is the 4D seismic surveys, okay? When they are compared, and usually we do it by subtracting, but it doesn't need to be a subtraction, but it's common to subtract the, the image. Uh, what we have, the production effects, uh, on the production effects are highlighted on the seismic signals. So, you know, it's like, it's the same thing if we have a, a picture. Well, here it's not very easy because they are not exactly in the same position, but let's assume the four women here, they were exactly at the same position in all the pictures. If I just subtract one picture from the other, I would see the difference, right? I would see that, uh, well, the hair is now, uh, she's, she's got a, 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 a haircut here and, and it was longer before. Uh, the wrinkles, uh, I mean, someone is fatter or is lean or more 
thing. So all the difference will be highlighted, right? So it's the same for the oil field. So when we, when we have two images and we subtract and compare them, we're going to see some difference. So what happened? And that's exactly what I'm showing here. So this image is an image from uh, from some people. It's a paper from Petrobras. So that's uh, one, of, one of the Brazilian fields, which has uh, 4D. So it's called, so that's Marlene. This was uh, one of all the most important reservoir before the pre-salt, because this is not pre-salt. So this is, uh, that's a sandstone. Uh, but anyway, this was a very important field. It is still. Uh, and, and what they are showing here, so this is a map. So that's a map view of the reservoir. And these things in blue, are the waters so this field is, is being produced by water flow and when you subtract so this image is a subtraction between two seismic surfaces it's a map of the reservoir and it's a difference between the one of the the surface and the baseline okay so we can see here so there was um uh there was some uh water injector wells in the field and we can see the path the water uh is is doing uh uh, uh, when you are injecting the field. So you can see the water movement into the rocks. So this is something very nice. So that this type of, of, of image uh, is very important for field management. You know, because if you're going to fill, let's say you're going to propose an infill well for this field. If you know there is, let's say, water here, of course, you're not going to drill here, right? So it, it, it helps you to find uh, sweet spots. Well, that's one of the things. So this is just one of the things, actually, uh, because you can extract much more information. You can extract the information of the, the positional system, so the, the direction of the depositional system. Uh, sometimes we can identify some faults uh, that we could not identify in the 3D seismic data because of resolution, but here we can see it. So there are a lot of things that happen in the field that we can visualize with 4D seismic data, okay? Uh, all right, so just to explain a little bit more uh, what's happening with the 4D seismic signal. So uh, again, so this is like if you look at this as a log data, right? So have one rock here, the reservoir is in yellow, and the, the so that's the overburden, the reservoir, and the other burning rock, right? So like a well log data. Uh, so the reservoir is in yellow here, and then initially it has a, a density, a rock density, and a rock velocity, and all the properties, right? So after you start produce, producing the field, so you change the pressure of the reservoir rocks, you change the fluid content, because you start to inject water, for instance, and before there was water, oil, oil so only oil, and now there is oil and water, so you're changing the rock. So when you acquire, so that's the seismic signal, and when you acquire a new survey, so the blue one is the new seismic signals. So these signals, they are different. Of course, they are different because the rock, in the reservoir rock is different. So it has a different uh, velocity of wave propagation, and there is a different density because you have, you're have you changing the fluids, right, and the pressure. So this difference calls an amplitude difference, so this signal here has a little bit, uh, this peak is a little bit stronger than, sorry, the new peak is less stronger than the old peak in, in black. And also there is what we call time shift, which is this, uh, so if you see the peak is here and now it's a little bit down, sorry, the peak was down here and now it's a little bit up. Because as you change the velocity of the wave propagation, so the time this wave is going to be captured by the receiver is also going to change because the velocity of propagation chain. Right? So there is these two things happen. So the time and the amplitude difference. Uh, but uh, so the time difference is important, but we use more often the amplitude difference. So which was the thing that I'm showing here. So that's the amplitude difference of the two signals, right? Okay. So that's the just a bit of history. Uh, so the the four D seismic data, the initial uh, application starts uh, in the eighties. So it starts uh, monitoring steam injection. Uh, so it was onshore applications, uh, and it's still now, nowadays it's a very good tool to monitor steam injection. Uh, 
and and people were uh, a little bit afraid of, of, of investing money in this uh, technology, you know, because this was an onshore field, so the cost was a little bit uh, low in terms of acquisition of information and operation of the field and so on. And, and so then, but then uh, the Norwegian guys, so that's where, so the Norway is the center of for this size of data. So that's where it starts to, to, to happen very strongly. So there is this uh, GoFox field, which is still operating, I guess. Uh, that was a milestone for the history of for this size of data. So because this is a offshore field and they showed with this field, uh they showed that the 4d seismic data would uh work uh for onshore uh, reservoir as well okay uh so why many people were uh worried about the onshore case because if you remember how we acquired the 4d seismic data we have that bolt right that is pulling the the cables away so the if you have to think that uh, to have a very nice uh, image of 4D information to, to be able to subtract the two, the two surveys, we need to acquire the data in a very controlled way. What I mean by that is the same thing for the pictures of the women, right? As I said, to, do, to take the two pictures and do a subtraction of them, we need to guarantee that those guys, I mean, those women, they were exactly at the same the same uh, uh, position, right? So that they can subtract the images. If you have someone a little bit shifted somewhere, of course, we are going to see difference that we don't want to see. So the for the seismic data has this problem as well. Uh, if we acquire the data at one moment, when we are going to acquire the second moment, we need to repeat the same conditions as much as possible. But then imagine how can we repeat the same conditions of, with the, those cables, you know, those cables in the ocean with kilometers of extensions uh, receiving the wave field. So how can we guarantee that those receivers are receiving exactly uh, uh, the wave field from that exactly partition location of the reservoir rocks? You know? So that's why people were not, uh, they, they don't, they were afraid of investing money on this technology. But in the end, they proved that it was working. So the GoFox field, uh, it was the first example, right? And it starts producing in, in this field, it started producing in 86, and the first month was acquired in 1995. So in the 90s, that's when uh, the 4 the size they start to, to show, uh, to be promising for a reservoir monitor on onshore, uh, sorry, offshore data. So nowadays, in the 2000s and so on, uh, the 4 size data is a very well-established technique. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, field case and, and examples showing the contributions to the production um, uh, to production and development of oil fields. Okay? There are several uh, case studies in the literature showing the success. So I put some reference here if you're interested. Uh, I'm going to show some of the examples, so two examples in the end, uh, one Brazilian case and another one, which is a, a quite complex view. And, and today, also something to highlight is that uh, our giant field, the pre-salt field, uh, some of them, uh, they have read like the Lula field, which is, I think they changed the name for 2P now. Uh, it has the 4D seismic data, they, they have just Finish the processing, uh, um, so it was acquired the first monitor, and also uh, there are other uh, pre-salt fields that they are planning to to have this type of monitor. Uh, so this is a, a sentence that I extract from this paper. So it says that it is a must do for all seriously interested in reservoir management. So it, it's it's today it's a very uh, well known tool uh, for reservoir management. So this chart is, 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 is funny and I think it brings some interesting uh, insights. So it's a bit of uh, philosophy in the class now. <laughs> so uh, what I'm showing here, so we have the uncertainties and then we have the knowledge, right? So we have low and high uncertainties and the, large, the knowledge that we have if it's low or high. So uh, there are some situations. So the first thing here that it's point is the no knows. So the no knows are uh, things that we know that we know, right? So if you think in a reservoir, I have a carbonate reservoir. So 
there is no uncertainty about that. So there is a low uncertainty about this information, right? I know it is a carbonate reservoir. Why I know that? Because I have core data, because I have log data, anything. I, I know it. So that's a no, something that I know, and I know that I know. Okay. Uh, then we have the known unknowns. So there are some, so this is related to high uncertainties, right? So there is a, a, a reservoir feature that uh, I don't know, but I know that I don't know. Okay, so I know, uh, let's say, I know that this reservoir, it's a carbonate. So it's probably a naturally fractured reservoir. But I know that I don't know where, how the fracture is, for instance, in this case, okay? So that's an information that I know that I don't know, okay? So this is one of the type of information. So it's the detail of the reservoir, uh, reservoir characterization, not really the detail, but some very important features that I don't know, but I really would like to know. I really would like to know how is the fracture network of my reservoir, but I don't, and I know that I don't, right? There is the third category, which is unknown unknowns. And this means uh, things about my reservoir that I don't even know that I don't know, okay? So it could be, let's say, uh, a fault or a fault, a sub-seismic fault. There are some geological structures hidden there that the 3D seismic data did not reveal it. So I don't even know that fault was there. I, I, don't, I didn't even know that this fault was sealing part of my reservoir. So these type of things, it's impossible for us to, to guess, right? So those things that we don't know, and then we, of course, I'm not going to look for it because I don't know it, it exists, right? Uh, the other type of information is known knowns, unknown knowns, but these are more, well, these are things that I know, but I usually forget. So this is not really apl applicable for our discussions, right? So in terms of 4D size data, uh, the 4D size data play a very uh, important role to work with these two type of things, to these two type of information. So the no one knows, so it has, it adds some values because it might ha help you to identify features that you think, that you know that you don't know, okay? Things related to the reservoir. Let's say you know you have a fault, but you don't know if this fault is sealing or not. So maybe the, the size media, the 4D size data can reveal it. But the unknowns on, the unknown unknowns are the things that brings much, much more value for the field management. Because uh, the 4D size data has this potential of revealing things that you have no idea about, of bringing surprise about the reservoir. Okay, so that's what this uh, author here is, is, is highlighting here. So the unknown unknowns can generate more value than we could have predicted. So this is re this is situation is very common with for this seismic data. Okay, that's again what I'm saying here. The unknown unknowns are very are the ones that bring value to for this seismic data, right? Uh, and as this author says, uh, the for this seismic data will reveal that we know less about our reservoirs than we think. This is very common, you know, this is very common. So it's very common that the 4D seismic data bring us some surprise, you know, so, uh, so that's something uh, very, very interesting. Uh, another thing that came to my mind that I could have brought, I think I have an image I can show later, but uh, the case, one of this case that we work in one of the projects, Unicin projects, we have a 4D size service, so it's a, a heavy oil. So, and as a heavy oil, we don't have any gas in the reservoir, and we don't see any gas production even in all the wells, the producer wells that are already drilled. There is no gas at all. But then when, we, when they acquire the 4D seismic data, it appears a huge 4D signals relate to gas. So this is an example of things of unknown unknowns, you know. So, so from the other data, for, for the well, log, for the well, from the well logs, we saw there was no, no free gas. And even from the production profiles, I mean, the oil rates, there was no gas. But then at some portion of the field, there, we can see gas there. So what happened is that some gas came out of solution because of depletion, but this gas of solution somehow trapped it and it didn't re reach the, the well, the producer wells. So 
this uh, this this is just one example of an unknown nose that that happened in one of the case that we were in, in missing. Okay. So uh, the value of for this seismic data, okay, it can increase the, the recovery factor. Of course, if you know better the field, you can operate better. So it can increase, people say, from 3 to 7% of the recovery factor. Uh, the very same field, the GoFox that I mentioned before, uh, they say that the for this size contributed directly to more than 19 successful wells. Uh, it generates a net present value of $1 billion. And just for a comparison purpose, uh, the total value of a 4D size, uh, so for, for this size data uh, serving and processing uh, was estimated around $60 million, right? So $1 billion against $60 billion. So, of course, there is an investment, but uh, it's, uh, it's worth, right? Uh, so this kind of things, it, it's very hard to find these, these studies related to, to the value of 4D seismic data. So this is one that they actually did some calculations. Uh, another thing, well, I'm saying I'm saying he's tatoy, but I should change for Ekinor, right? So now it's Ekinor. Uh, another case, uh, this is another field uh, that is operated by Ekinor, the Norn field. Uh, and it's a, it's a very ma mature field, and the, the, the recovery factor, of, so I think this is not really up to date, so this was something from seven years ago, I need to update that. Uh, but anyway, so at this moment, the, the recovery factor was 56%, and they have the intention to, to go to up to 58%. So, and this is a very mature field. So this was really a challenge. And they say, they mentioned uh, that the for the seismic data would be the key to, to achieve this goal. You know? Because that's how they see uh, to, incre to increase the, the recovery factor. So that's a very important uh, tool. So uh, another things uh, that the for the seismic data can bring is to increase uh, reserves. Uh, to reduce the drilling costs and uh, a better geological model, so which of course uh, generates uh, improves the production forecast. Okay. All right. So, uh, how much uh, does it cost to, to run a 4D seismic survey? So, uh, this reference that I picked from uh, this was a, a course from uh, Marcus Groschau, he's a geophysicist in, in, in Petrobras. And this is, uh, because these values, it's very hard to find, you know, the values of uh, acquisition costs and, and the values of the well drilling. So it's not something very easy to find the literature. So he did this comparison and, and I picked this comparison to bring to you just for you to have an idea. Uh, but for, for onshore cases, uh, Seismic data costs around from five to thirty-five percent of the price of a well. Uh, for shallow water, this comes from ten to fifty percent, more or less, uh, of a well. When we move to deep water, then this uh, the value of for this size data is much higher because it's more or less ten percent of a well. So, although uh, as I said, although it requires investment. Because you need, of course, you need to pay for acquisition, for processing, and even for interpretations. Uh, but usually, it's very well paid. Especially if you're thinking in, in the pre-salt, the giant uh, pre-salt fields in Brazil, where the drilling costs are really, really high. So this type of technology, uh, uh, it's it's worse. I mean, it's it has a, a very good payback. Uh, okay, so success case, uh, the North Sea, so as I said, in the region, uh, especially uh, the, the fields operated by Satoy, the North Sea, uh, there is an extensive 4D activity. So they were the pioneers of this technology. They, in, still nowadays, they are very known uh, for applying this uh, technology. There are some deep waters uh, fields in Africa, Brazil as well, and, and the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the 4D seismic data, it's a very good ally for EOR process because, as we know, EOR, it's a, it's a, usually uh, it, it's an expensive, they, they require some, some investments, it's, a, it's an expensive procedure, right? And so it increased the necessity of monitoring. So, they, they, so the 4D seismic data, uh, it's a very good ally for that. 
the field submitted to thermal recovery process. So this is also, uh, there are very interesting um, uh, words uh, on the literature showing the, the monitor of thermal recovery process. Uh, they have, uh, by the way, uh, this is, uh, of course, they're on, sh on shore fields, right? So um, yeah, there was a work, I can't remember the reference in my, my head now, but uh, they did what they call size move which was a very interesting thing, you know, because they, they have a, a permanent reservoir monitor, so they install the, the size uh, uh, receptors in the field, and they were acquiring data very often. So I think it was daily, if I'm not wrong. And so, so that uh, it, this was acquiring data from a field under a thermal uh, recovery process, right? So it, I think it was steam injection. So they, uh, they, they, as they were acquiring a lot of data, it was like a daily data, they were able to generate a, a move. So it was interesting because the, the, the for the seismic data uh, could show how was how this team was traveling, how the team was traveling into the, the oil legs, into the, the reservoir. It's, that's a very nice uh, application. Uh, another thing uh, that is uh, that's very, uh, uh, actually a very, um, appealing uh, procedure uh, application for, for the problems we have nowadays is the CO2 monitor. So the monitor of CO2 uh, is for, for some reasons. For instance, for, for when you use CO2 as a ER process, or if you are uh, re-injecting the CO2 uh, into the reservoir, so you can monitor how the CO2 is traveling in the reservoir. Uh, uh, and, but also, uh, so, we can look at the CO2 as a, a recovery process, uh, the CO2 injection, but also uh, the CO2 discard, uh, discard, yes, into into other formations, like an aquifer, for instance. So there are some some words uh, from 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 some people from Statoy, if I'm not wrong, from the from Norway, where they're using for the seismic data to monitor uh, the the discard of CO2 into aquifers, right? Okay, so uh, these are uh, just some pictures I picked from the, the website from Petrobras, uh, just to mention that the 4D size data uh, is, uh, that's something that it's already happened for Lula Field. As I, I told you, they, they have already run, uh, they have already uh, acquired the data and processed the first monitor. Uh, this is another uh, Partnership between Shell and Petrobras, uh, yes, to reduce the the costs of of for the size of data to be used in pre-salt reservoirs. And so just some news to, to to bring you to say that that's something. Uh, it's an important tool for for the for the Brazilian fields, uh, the most important fields we have in in, in Brazil today. Um, I think. Uh, I'm going to, to stop uh, a little bit now, uh, it's 9.22, then we, we come back uh, with from, from this point, okay? Let's stop a little bit, drink some water, and then we come back in, in 15 minutes, is that okay? How, how long is the break, uh, usually, Daniel?